So, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Paul uh, Hajiba, uh, who's director of the Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, it's probably one of the more progressive uh, DOTs in the country, and we're very happy to have him. Uh, Mr. Hajiba has had over 30 years of experience with the Michigan DOT. He actually started off in their engineering development program, worked in various uh, components of the DOT before he went into operations. He has served as Metro Regional Engineer as well as U University Region Engineer. He's a proud alumni of Prairie View A&M University, and he has a master's, in, uh, master's degree in construction engineering from the University of Michigan. Uh, he currently serves on a number of boards, including ASHTO, ITS America, M-City, University of Michigan College of Engineering, the Engineering Society of Detroit, and the Mackinac Bridge Authority. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like you to welcome uh, Paul Ajiba. Paul, we're very glad to have you speak to our uh, to our program today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Rolette, for um, inviting me. I uh, also wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Perkins. Uh, I, I got to know uh, uh, Professor Rolette uh, two years ago, met, met him in, in D.C. at a... Uh, uh, is, ACEC uh, grading uh, competition and got to uh, exchange numbers and got to know each other a little better. And I, again, thank you for inviting me. This to me proves what the power of networking is about. Uh, when you meet people, uh, get to know them a little bit, exchange uh, numbers and ideas and you never know where it's gonna lead. I, uh, I'm here I am speaking to the group today. Uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Talk a little bit about my background, um, the education and the employment history, and then talk about some of the opportunities that uh, being in, in a leadership position at MDAT has helped me be able to uh, create some opportunities for uh, students in the HBCU schools. Uh, and I hope uh, at the end of the presentation, we can get into some uh, discussions and uh, Q&A on any uh, any issues you may uh, want to learn about my background uh, and how I got to, to this point. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so as far as my background, I, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I came to the United States uh, when I was 19, uh, 1982, uh, to go to college. I started my uh, uh, educational career in the United States at a very small community college called uh, Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. Uh, it, it, it was kind of a, a chance that I ended up at Prairie View. Uh, I spent a, a year at Monroe Community College. I spent the, the fall semester and the winter semester. Right after the winter semester in April, I just happened to be having a conversation with my cousin Charles in 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 Houston at that time that, uh, well, you know, I'm done with this season. I'm going to try and get a job. I'm, I'm bored. And the next thing you know, he said, well, why don't you come and hang out with me in the summer in uh, Prairie View? And I said, well, okay. I didn't have money to, uh, to, to get a plane ticket. So I got a, a Greyhound a bus ticket. Took me about two days on a Greyhound bus ticket. I ended up at Prairie View. And um, before you know it, I enrolled in a, a statics class in, in Prairie View at that time. I got a job at McDonald's. Him and I will we, you know, we'll commute to uh, Brenham, Texas and walk all, all summer and got a chance to really spend some time together. Uh, but uh, during that time, my initial goal was to be an architect. But um, after my, my second semester at Monroe Community College, I realized that I, I didn't have the patience to, to sit on a desk and draw. In those days, we didn't have the CAD system. You have to draw everything by hand. So I, I was getting frustrated with trying to continue my career in the architectural field. So when I took that statics class at Prairie View, I, I truly enjoyed it. it the, the concept of statics and dynamics came to me easily. I said, well, let me you know, take another class. That's, I took dynamics. I really enjoyed it. So slowly, I ended up changing my, my major from uh, architecture to, to civil engineering because in, in those days, and I still presume that's the case, uh, as an architect, you have to take some, 
some civil engineering classes. Uh, you have to take statics, dynamics, and a little bit of structural analysis so you know how the buildings are held, you know, how it's held up, right? So that was what I was trying to do, fulfill some of my uh, elective, uh, um, my electives in the civil engineering program to apply to my architectural career. But then I found out that maybe civil engineering is my calling. So that, that the fall, I ended up uh, changing my major to civil engineering and it's been a, a blast since then. Um, my marital status, I married. I have a daughter who's a medical doctor doing her residency in Miami, Florida right now. Uh, she went to, she never got a chance to experience the HBCU life like I did. Uh, trust me, I did everything I could to stay in, ha in that direction, but it just didn't work out. She got a scholarship to go to the University of Michigan from there. She uh, got a scholarship to go to Columbia for a uh, 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 Masters in public health, and then uh, we we practically begged her to come back home to do to go to medical school at Michigan State University, because when she was in, at Columbia in New York, we missed her dearly. So uh, she's doing great there; everything's fine uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the the family life. But uh, my my time at Prairie View was probably the the most I, I can say uh, developed me to who I am today. I, I always tell um, our students when I get a chance to talk to them who are in the HBCU uh, schools, you are getting a, a quality education for a fraction of the cost. When you come out of HBCU, you want to make sure you know your basics in any curriculum, any uh, profession you are in. When you get out here, I promise you, the education and the experience you, you're taking out of Prairie View will take you a long way. Having that basic knowledge of, the, of your profession, will you can compete anywhere. When I enrolled, at, well, before I get to how I enrolled at University of Michigan, I, I got it recruited I, right as about, I was about to graduate from Prairie View. I got recruited by a, a very small company here in Detroit. This is how I ended up in Michigan. And um, this company won a $200 million uh, uh, wastewater treatment uh, design project at, uh, uh, with the city of Detroit. And the, the owner of that company at the time did not want to get too big. So he hired a lot of us young engineers to come in and work on the project. I was uh, one of the uh, main structural engineers on, on that job. So, but the, the issue was we work practically seven days a week, 24 seven. I worked, I worked for the company for three years and after three years I got burned out. I, I had saved up a lot of money. I decided I'm gonna go to graduate school. So I, I quit, I went to, to grad school and right after I was finishing up my, my, my master's degree at University of Michigan, the, uh, the uh, uh, Michigan Department of Transportation, they had a career fair. Michigan Department of Transportation was there as part of the career fair. I just walked by, I dropped off my resume to some of the uh, companies that I thought I, I, could, I could work for. And then um, they called me in for an interview the next day, went for an interview and I was offered the job. Uh, one of the, the things that's made me really enjoy working at uh, MDAT is the fact that when I came in, they have this program. It's, it's called the Engineering Development Program. It's a program where they bring in young engineers uh, for almost two years, 18 months to two years. They kind of rotate you around different aspects of, of the department. You go to planning, traffic and safety, operations, maintenance, design, construction, and you kind of learn each area. You spend two, two months roughly in each area, and then afterwards, they sit you down and say, okay, of all these areas you've been to, which one would you rather work on? And I, at that time, I really enjoyed that, the traffic and safety and operations side of things, and I said I would like to do that. So I did that for several years, and then... Um, you know, I, I found myself saying, you know, I got this master's program. I've never really used it. 
so when people say, well, why are you even going for a master's degree? I would, I would give you my, my thoughts on that in a minute. So after about maybe 10 years, I said, no, I, I need to challenge myself more because I, I got very good at what I was doing. I was comfortable. Uh, I had a mentor at that time that was pushing me. You got to get your PE license. You got to get your PE license. And, you know, after you've, you've been out of school for about five, six years, your study habits has changed. You're now settled in your new way of, of uh, enjoying life, go to work, make money, you know, spend your weekend playing golf, doing other things. Going back, trying to reprogram yourself, going back to studying, it is very, very tough. So one of the advice I'm going to give you today is that once you come out, Try to get your PE right away if you got to get going. Don't wait five, six years like I did. But anyway, uh, and also remember to have a mentor in whatever you profession you end up in, in that organization or company. Try to have somebody that's way above you in the leadership that can guide and mentor your, your career through through that uh, organization, because that was very helpful to me to have people that say, hey, you have potential. We think you need to get your PE. You need to do this, do that. They were pushing me. Anyway, we had a big project uh, out south of where uh, Detroit is. It was about a $50 million reconstruction job. And I I raised my hand and said, well, I would like to go be the construction engineer on that job. I'm like, well, you don't have construction experience. I said, well, but I have a construction engineering degree. And, you know, I'm, I'm too comfortable where I am right now. I would like to go try that. And every time I look back at that decision, I, I think I am here now because of that. So don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, yeah, I want to try something different. Don't get too comfortable in where you are because you can... You can get lost in, 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 in just being comfortable in your environment, challenge yourselves. So I did that. I went and I, and I built that project. It was very successful. We were on time, on budget, and there were no claims. In those days, it is a miracle when you build a job like that and you are not at the end of the project fighting with contract on how to, to balance uh, the, 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 the books on who owes who money. And that's, that's the claim process because contractors always look for ways. I won't say always, but in most cases, a big job like that, there's always a claim. But we didn't have any. It's because you know why? When I went in there, I did not go in there with the mindset of m m that's one of the mistakes most engineers make because we have been programmed to, uh, you know, in, in our profession, it's either black or white. Two plus two is four. There is no ambiguity. But in real life, you have to understand that you, you have to look for ways to compromise. And I think the, the, the idea of being able to compromise, I believe what made me successful in, in, in that project. Next slide, please. Right after I was done with that project, I, be, I got a opportunity uh, for promotion to be uh, what we call a, a transportation service uh, manager. We only had about, 26 or 27 of them in the state. And that, that is a big deal to move up to uh, running your own office. That means you control your own budget. You have staff and on and on and on. You start getting your, your feet wet in, in the politics of, of uh, 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 working in a public agency because you're dealing with a lot of politicians. And how do you navigate your way through a lot of the... Uh, of the issues that, that politicians would bring up. Um, so I, I truly enjoyed that. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, I, I did the traffic and safety and operations engineer thing for a while. Uh, we can go to the next slide. This is the, uh, the project that I, I was talking about, the, the, uh, the, the construction engineering uh, piece of it. Even though it says 37 million here, but we had a whole lot of other stuff that was added to the original contract. But the point is that taking myself 
away from my comfort zone to go out there and try this, I think is what on one of the advice I'm going to give you. You are going to go into the professional world and you're going to have a comfortable job. The question is, you always have to ask yourself, is this benefiting me to help me move to the next level, either in this organization, company, or to use it somewhere else, to move somewhere else. Don't get too comfortable in any position because again, it's all about growing. Uh, I, I, as I said, the, the, this, this project here was probably the most challenging thing I've ever done. And I, I, every time I look back now, it was probably the, the best decision I ever made. Next slide, please. Uh, this is still talking about the, the project, obviously. Next slide. So while I was uh, a, a, a transportation service uh, center manager, I, I did a lot of great things there uh, because I had a lot of uh, great staff. We worked hard with a lot of politicians. The, the area that I was called Oakland County. If you've ever been in Michigan, Oakland County is... Uh, is the, the richest county in the state where people, uh, you know, they, they are not used to hearing a note from anybody. It would, they, they, they will say they, they, they pay the highest tax, property tax in the, in the whole state, and that is probably true. You've got some uh, 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 auto company executives lives there, so having that opportunity to, to navigate the politics of that, I think really uh, helped me and my team in, in, in there. We built a lot of uh, very uh, big projects. The, I, uh, the M10 large freeway reconstruction project was I think about a hundred and something million dollar job. Uh, Southfield freeway, which is another major corridor in, in Oakland County. I-96 reconstruction in Livonia was another one. Uh, uh, and then uh, I-94 construction in Port Huron. Um, when I, 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 then I got promoted to be the deputy region engineer Metro. Metro region, as I said, is Oakland County, Macomb County, and Wayne County. These are the three uh, most populated uh, counties in the whole state of Michigan. It's in the southeast side of Michigan. Uh, Michigan is a big state, obviously, but you know the southeast side is where the population is concentrated. And uh, these projects, you know, you, you learn and you go to school to be an engineer, a civil engineer, but you found out that uh, being a civil engineer, your role expands as, as you get more and more into it. The days of where and that as an organization, we just go and close a freeway and start, well, it's our freeway, we got a re work to do, leave us alone. Those days are gone. We had to go out in the community and sell the project. And the community is shouting at you and just on and on about, you're gonna close this freeway to do this project the whole summer? How am I gonna to get to work? On and on. So you have to sell the project. This is something you don't learn in school. You learn on the job, right? You don't public meetings, uh, but your, your technical expertise still comes true because you have to explain how you're going to build the job and how you're going to accommodate traffic during that time. So my experience in traffic and safety and operations and my construction experience building the US-23 project truly helped me a lot uh, understanding how you communicate this kind of uh, stuff to, to the general public. Again, these, these list of uh, notable projects were projects that we did when I was uh, in Oakland TSC and also as the uh, deputy region engineer. So I was deputy region engineer for two years. Then, uh, next slide please. Then I got promoted to be a region engineer in uh, university region. University region, we call it university region because it covers uh, Washington County, which is home to the University of Michigan. Uh, it also covers Ingham County, which is home to Michigan State University. Uh, Monroe down as you, you're on the, uh, bottom slide, uh, right side of this uh, of the slide, you can see where, where University Region covers. So <clears throat> I was there for, for about uh, seven years between July 2011 to September 20, 
18. And in that time, one of the things I always try to do, again, perhaps I, I seek challenges where there is none. We had a project, US 23 Flex Route, first in, this, in the state, and it, it won an um, uh, eminent concept award. If you've ever been on the ACEC uh, award uh, recognition uh, uh, grading where I met, uh, met uh, Professor Roulette, it is a very, very tedious process to make it even to the top 20. And this project won, uh, it was one of the top 12 in the country. What this project entails is this, we have a two lane section of roadway between Ann Arbor and Brighton. Uh, for some of you, it, it, it's in that map there. It's a highly congested corridor where every morning people, everybody comes into Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor is a major employer. The, the university is there, the hospital is one of the biggest and best in the state, quite frankly. And then in the evening, when people are leaving to come out of Ann Arbor but to go home to the suburbs, it's, it's a parking lot. If you have a fender bender out there, people are uh, stuck out there for hours, even before the emergency vehicles can get there. So the challenge for this project is this, are we going to buy right away and spend about $400 million to buy right away? And we had also other challenges, environmental challenges, because we have what you call Mississauga uh, snake, uh, which is a very rare species in the country uh, along that corridor. So the environmental study alone is mm -hmm. going to bug you down, right? We also have uh, what you call the, the long air bats, which is uh, another species. Uh, very rare species. So this, it, these were such compounding issues where that project has not been, that corridor has not been touched for a while. So when I got to University of Virginia, I said, no, we're gonna do something about this. We started looking at uh, alternatives. We decided, okay, we're gonna collapse the, the, the middle of the project. We're gonna, we're gonna build wider shoulders there where in the morning, people coming south into Ann Arbor can use the shoulder as a lane. And then in the evening, when they're leaving, they can use the shoulder as a lane to get out. So you're practically creating a three lane without calling it a lane, it, it's a wide shoulder. So I led the effort to do that. And believe me, the, the problem with uh, the idea of widening is not only too costly, it is also the fact that you don't need three or four lanes out there every day and, you know, 24 seven. It's a three hour problem. Three hours in the morning between six and 9 a.m. when people are trying to get into an apple. And three hour problem in the evening when people are trying to get out of an apple between four to seven. So we said, why would we want to spend all this money, get bogged down on environmental issues when uh, and try to build a 24 hour solution to a six hour problem? So that's how the concept of the flex route came to be. And we, we, we worked with the Federal Highway Administration. We did the project. It, it, it was very successful. Uh, initial, initially, when we went out in the community selling this, I can't even give you a lot of the negative comments we heard from people. This is never going to work on and on. And that's the other thing I'm going to say. If you believe in your convictions, believe in yourselves. Vet your idea, make sure it, it, it's the right thing. If you know you're doing the right thing, keep on going. You're going to, the, the idea of leadership, in my opinion, is first self-confidence. If you want people to follow you, they got to believe you. They got to believe that you know what you're talking about. You believe in, in, in the concept that you're trying to get the buy-in, and then they'll follow you. And I think that's what we did here. We had a lot of uh, pushback, not only in the community, in the public. We don't want this. This is just on and on and on and on. But again, it became a very successful project. And I, I think uh, part of that was the fact that after we opened it, the, we had the governor come out there, uh, the governor at the time, um, you know, did the ribbon cutting and say, I, I believe in this. Because the governor used that corridor every morning as well. He's, he, he used to go, uh, when he's leaving in the morning, he lived in Enabo. When he's going to Lansing in the morning, he's, he sees traffic backed up on the south side. 
And when so he's going against traffic, but you can see say it. So he was in favor of us doing this, and I think that also helped us. But we had to sell it to him as well that this is going to work because one of the po point is you spend all this money to do this. What if it doesn't work? But that's to me is why you have modeling. You model it and see if the result is what you expect. And I think, uh, again, one of the successful projects I've been a part of that I, 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 I led the effort to, to get through. Next slide, please. So uh, after uh, uh, being in the university region for about seven years, I, I, I got another promotion to go, back to, to go back to Metro as the region engineer because the Metro region engineer at that time uh, became my boss. He, he, he got promoted to be the uh, chief operations officer. So I, I, I got to Metro in September uh, 2018, just uh, haven't even unpacked my, bo my boxes. Obviously, election came. And somehow, again, that's why I believe you the power of network is very, very important. Based on a lot of the networks I've built over the years, I, I did not even know that some of them had recommended me to the new uh, governor. Uh, right after the election, I got a call to come and apply for the job of the director of, of the uh, Michigan Department of Transportation. I did meet her during the uh, campaign. I met her on, on, on a couple of times on the trail. I, I got introduced to her. We, you know, she you know, we, we, we chatted about what, what are my vision of transportation and I, I gave it, I guess I made a good impression on her. So I interviewed for the, for the job of the director and um, January, 2019, I, uh, I, I, I got uh, appointed as, as the director of, of, of the Department of Transportation. Uh, for me, it, it's a bittersweet uh, ending to a good career because I started in as an entry level engineer. So being in the department for 28 years before I became director, I, I know a lot of the people and I've seen a, the evolution of the department. I know all the things that the department, the needs of the department. I know the, the roads from Southeast Michigan all the way to the superior region, the upper peninsula, I, I've, I've traveled them. So it, it, the, the transition from my, uh, my position as the Metro Region Engineer to being director was a little easier compared to some, some people that would have to go through that learning curve because I, I, knew, I knew a lot of, uh, I, I knew the system. So here we are, as the director, your role changes completely. Not that you don't still get involved in engineering, but your engineering involvement is very, very limited. You, you, you're dealing with a lot of politicians. You're out there trying to sell the governor's vision. And I am so fortunate that I am working for a governor that her main campaign theme was fixing, please pardon my language, fixing the damn road. That was her campaign pr uh, pledge. And to me, as a civil engineer working at MDAT, that's sweet music because we've never had a governor that was so focused on us fixing our infrastructure like we have in her. So it made my job easier to get out there and say, hey, I've been in this department 30 years. I've seen governors come and go. I've seen directors come and go. This is the very first governor that say, our roads and bridges are bad. We need to do something about it if we want to continue to be a very competitive state economically. So that's been what I've been doing since uh, January 2019. Um, I, I am having a, a blast doing this. But I go back to my Prairie View experience. If not from all the things I learned at Prairie View, I don't honestly don't believe I would be here. Purvi also taught me about perseverance and being resilient. When I was at the University of Michigan uh, in, in graduate school, I was the only only minority student in in my program, and I got through. Ask me, well, why 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 do you need graduate school? I would tell you one thing that um, what during my career, my very first job 
was traffic and safety operations engineer. So there was an opening to, um, we were try, we'll call the engineer level 11. There was an opening for uh, engineer level 12 position. And I applied for it, so did a lot of other uh, people in, in my um, level at that time that just came off the engineering development program. And I was not selected. The, the person that was selected was uh, a guy with a bachelor's degree. And I was very upset at that time. So I went to the supervisor because they give you a chance after they, they, they've picked the, the, the selected candidate, you can come and talk to them and find out why were you weren't selected. I was very, very upset. I said, wait a minute, how can you pick this person over me when I have a master's degree and he only has a bachelor's degree? On and on and on and on. And you know what they told me? The job did not require a master's degree. So it, it, when, when you hear that, you're like, well, why did I go get a master's degree if, if it, the job doesn't require a, a, a master's degree? But I will tell you again, if not for me going to get my master's degree, I would not have put up my hand to say, I want to go build that US 23 reconstruction project because that was my area of expertise. And the, 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 the experience I gained going from an HBCU school to a very big university like University of Michigan is that competitive spirit. I, and I, I, didn't, I didn't take it personal, even though, as I said, I was upset, but I went along with it, but it, it motivated me to say, okay, I wanna do more. I, I, I'm gonna raise up my hand uh, when the opportunity comes. And I will tell you the, uh, the selected candidate, he just retired from MDOT, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, January of this year. But where my career ended up and where he did, it's totally different. So your, your master's degree may not pay off initially. Believe me, over time, that experience, nobody can take that away from you. You're always going to need that. And you're always going to have to apply. Uh, so for me, it, it's been a, a, a very rewarding journey that I would not trade anything in the world to for. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, after 31 years, I, I also try to uh, make myself available to my community. Uh, the, one of the, you know, the, these awards are great, but the, the, I served on the Ann Arbor Transportation Authority Board for six years. Learning how boards function, learning the intricacies of the politics of being on a board, I think it's very important as well. When you get the opportunity to do that, I think you should. Because you know, a lot of the things you see, uh, most board meetings are published now, right? Believe me, a lot of the issues are resolved before it comes to, 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 to the public because you have what you call committees. The committees vet a lot of these issues they, they try to solve all the problems so that when they come in front of the public, they're given reports. At that point, it's more of a congenial uh, environment. They all, all the ugly sausage making process is done behind the scenes. This, the, 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 the beauty of the sausage is what's presented in front of, in front of the camera and everybody thinks, uh, Oh, walking on, on boards, it's, it's wonderful. It's not always wonderful, but I always believe it helps shape you professionally. So you ever get opportunity to do that, please sign up and be uh, on, on a board that, that you can help uh, advance the cost of your profession. So with that, I, I don't know, uh, Professor Perkins, Professor, are we doing a Q&A session? Yes, sir, we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if first, thank you very much um, for your presentation and um, kudos to uh, being a, a, a PV Panther. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, we do uh, uh, want to uh, spend uh, some time um, asking questions and uh, just, uh, you know, 
raise the appropriate icon to let me know if you have a question. And we do. We got one out the box from Texas. I mean, from Tennessee State University. Ms. Uh, uh, Kiana, uh, please ask your question and then I'll come to you, Paul and Janet as well as no. OK, Paul, you'll be next. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very uh, interesting. I like everything that you were talking about, just seeing you climb up like the corporate ladder, it was very interesting. Well, um, I'm Kiana, uh, I'm a civil engineering junior at Tennessee State University, and I'm actually set for an internship with the Michigan Department of Transportation this summer in the traffic um, the operations and ITS uh, department. So yeah, I, I, was, I was actually making my lunch, but I ran to the computer when I heard MDOT. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm... <laughs> I'm really glad, like it's a small world, but um, enough about that. Okay. So my question is, um, I'm I'm very you know social and I love to network and you know in my career wherever I end up, I would like for that to still be part of what I'm doing. Like I mm -hmm. want to be able to travel to talk to politicians, um, other engineers. Just like I like to uh, share my ideas and I definitely like to talk. <laughs> so my question is like, where do you get your possibly like your experience with politics to be able to socialize with the governor or the president or whoever you need to, to get those projects underway? I, I think it comes with, with experience. Uh, for me, as a very sociable person like you, uh, you can blend into the political side easily. You, you, you can be an introverted person. I think when, when you meet, uh, there's some that has the talent that when they meet people, uh, they, they, they make friends easily, right? And that's what I, I try to do over the years is, you, I, I, you know, when I meet people, I'm curious about them. I want to know more about them. I, I think uh, Professor Roulette will tell you how we, as I said, how we met. It was just, we were all sitting there having, uh, I think it was lunchtime. We started chatting and uh, I found out that he was a professor in Nebraska and on and on and on. And um, by the time we were leaving the, the two day uh, get together, the weekend it was a weekend. Uh, and I said, well, you know, we exchanged numbers. So yeah, I think I got this program now. You you will be a great person uh, to speak in the program. But the other thing I, I want to I wanna mention that I, I probably didn't say much about in my presentation is, when you get to a, a position where you can lift up others, try to do that. Our transportation diversity recruitment program that you're gonna be a part of this summer, I, I, would, I don't wanna claim credit for the whole thing, but it was just an idea. I was sitting around with uh, the University of Michigan having a conversation with them because they invited some of us alumni to come in and talk to how they can improve the number of uh, minorities in, in the engineering program. And I just brought it up that why don't we have a combined program where uh, we bring the students in, we'll give them a job and they stay on a U of M campus. You can use that opportunity to try to show them the campus, woo them. And for us, we also use the opportunity to try to recruit them. And we started with four students from Morehouse. It's now belong to what it is now. We're going to have 58 students from different HBCU schools all over the country in Michigan this summer. And that is a program that I'm very, very proud of because uh, it's getting the national recognition that I think it, it deserves. We know we're not going to be able to hire all you guys when you get out of, out of college. But we want you, when you come for that summer program, to live with an experience that you can use anywhere in the country. And that's the objective. So thank you for that question. I'm very excited to come. Thank you for answering. Looking forward to having you. Paul, did you uh, want to ask your question before Chica? All right. Good afternoon, Doc. Hi, how are you? It's Grace, I'm fine. Good. I'm Paul. Of Southern University. I don't mean I'm doing my master's in engineering mm -hmm. related uh, water and energy, real estate energy. Uh, I wanted to know actually, I'm an international student from Ghana. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know the opportunities for 
international students are taught because um, <clears throat> I was told that it's more reserved for citizens. I, I don't believe that's the case. I, I think we had an international student last year. And my understanding is that uh, of the 58 students hired this year, there's another international student, uh, student in, the, in the mix of the 58 students. The other thing I would add is that th this program, last year we decided, okay, let's not just make it an MDAP program. Uh, one of the beauty of being the director is that I have relationships with the industry, with the uh, SCEC community here in Michigan, with, with the MITRE, which is the construction arm of, of the industry. So what we did is I went before the board and say, listen, let's look at, use this opportunity to recruit minorities into your companies as well. Uh, we're gonna bring in students, uh, for a federal program, we can put them up. You give them a job in your company and maybe you, you might be able to find synergy. Last year was the first time we tried it with about 32 students and, and two of the students got uh, permanent employment before they left, they got offered jobs. And that's, that's what I'm hoping we, we, can, we can continue to do. With all 50 students are not going to work for MDAT. I believe uh, maybe about 30 is gonna work for MDAT, the rest are gonna work for the private sector. They truly embrace this program and they see that's opportunity for them too to recruit talents that are out there that people don't know about. So Michigan, I think is in the forefront of, to me, uh, something really big if we continue to, to uh, harness this program and make it what I believe it could be. My vision is that at some point, these companies will see the benefit of and the talent of you guys coming into Michigan and offer you offer you permanent positions before you leave, like like uh, like the two students that got uh, offered permanent positions last year. Okay, uh, Chica, and then Melinda. Okay, hi. Um, hi. First of all, I'm gonna start saying that we have way too much in common. I'm also from Nigeria, and <laughs> I am a proud Panther. You know, oh, so how about that? <laughs> hi, Chica. How are you? Good. I'm good, thank you. So my question to you is, um, I know you were speaking on after you had got your master's in construction um, and the job that you are currently working, they opened another, um, uh, I believe, side for um, a construction engineer and you spoke up and said that you wanted to go and mm -hmm. they were like, you don't have an experience, so mm -hmm. why do you want to go there? So. Um, how do you go about those situations or how do you know to stand your ground and be like, I know that I can do this and move forward with that and, you know, not come off as, you know, <laughs> any yes, fair, but that's the question. Yeah, I, I, again, I think that's what Prairie did for me, helped me build my confidence. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the master's degree did not help me in my first interview for uh, for a next promotion level because as i said they, they said well you don't need a master's degree for this even though i, I you know I, I was very upset but having that master's degree gave me credibility to be able to put my hand up and say uh, i want to be the construction engineer on that project and well you don't have a term but i said well but i have i have a degree in construction engineering i i i want i would like to put that to use so it, it may not have helped me initially, but I think it helped me on the long run because I was able to say, hey, I have a master's degree that I think I, 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 could, I could use to, uh, to do this job. And they gave me the opportunity to go out there and do it. And, and we did, as I said, uh, we finished that job on time, on, on budget and no claims. And that's a true uh, mark of a successful project. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. It's good Have to that see you. confidence. Yes, yes good sir. Luck. thank you. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Melinda? Hello. Hi, Melinda. Um, I know you partially answered this question, but uh, in the situation where the person with the bachelor's degree got chosen, uh, 
for the position? Did that mean you were overqualified or how did you respond to that? And how did you know that master's was the right choice in that moment? Or did you think against it? Well, my, I went, I did, uh, as I mentioned, my presentation, well, after I graduated from Prairie View, I worked for this small consultant for three years. I, I, I just got burned out. Um, going for a master's degree was not even in my plan. I, I just, you know, it was either that or quit civil engineering completely. I decided, well, I'm just going to go get my master's degree. I'd saved up a lot of money and that, that's really how I ended up at University of Michigan. And then, you know, the, the, the not getting that initial job, it, it wasn't that I was overqualified. They're just saying that, you know, the, the, it, when you apply for a job, they will say these are the educational requirements, experience and all that. Uh, it did not require a master's degree. So, you know, you have a bachelor's degree, you're just as qualified. Uh, again, maybe the, the, the gentleman had a better interview than I did, and that's fine. Uh, but I was more focused on the fact that I had a master's degree. He did not. And we, were, we both came in about the same time. He, he you know, got out of the uh, engineering development program at the same time that the master's degree should give me a leg up over, over him. But, you know, when you're sitting in front of an interview panel, the interview, there's a lot more that they look at, not just your educational qualification. They look at the right fit. Maybe I was not the right fit for that position at the time. And that's okay. But I think, again, on the long run, having the master's degree always pays off. I, I truly, truly believe that's what helped me. Um, get to where I am now because I was able to use that degree to say I want to go do this job because I have this qualification. Thank you. That's motivating. Yeah. Charles, you'd like to ask yours? I'm Charles Riley from UMES. Uh, hey Charles, how are you? Eastern Shore. And uh, my question is, um, Melinda touched a part of it, but I would, I have like in two uh, forms. How would you advise someone who is overqualified for a position that he is so passionate about and wants to go there and then, um, contribute to um, the growth of that area? And two, how would you um, advise someone who is less qualified a position that he thinks he has the practical know-how to um, manage it. Thank you. So the, the, the first one about overqualification, I, I don't think there's anything like overqualification. It's a matter of what you want to do. I, I, I know people with PhDs that are comfortable uh, where they are, doing what they're doing, they enjoy doing that. Uh, for me, it was more of, I was so comfortable where I am, but I had mentors that, that, that believed in me and say, we think you could do more. And uh, we think you can go far. Just if you do this, do this, do that. Uh, sometime before I apply for a position, I would talk to my mentor. Well, what do you think about it? Is it? Knowing my personality, do you think this is the right fit for my career? And they'll advise me right or wrong. And in most times I would say they, 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 they're, they're right. So first you need a mentor. Uh, the underqualified thing, the way we do it at MDAP, you know, you'll, we'll have what you call selection criteria. Before you even get an interview, they look at your, your qualification, uh, your experience, and on and on. If you don't meet that criteria, you don't even get a chance to, to be interviewed. So I, I, I think, if you feel you, you have a passion in an area, but you're lacking all the tools you need to qualify for it, then go get those, those tools. Go, go, go to school, you know, do what you have to do, take the extra classes to get that qualification. If that's your passion, that's where you want to end up, then put in the work to get there. Um, for me, I, I think, uh, as I said, my, my first goal was to be an architect and I ended up being a civil engineer because I, 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 civil engineering came to me easier than being an architect. And 
perhaps that was my calling. I, I was just, you know, on a detour before I realized uh, I needed to get back in alignment. So it, it, it happens. If you think your passion is somewhere, but you don't have the tools to get there, then go get those tools. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is a Judy. Can you share with uh, us what the students encountered last summer, given that we were in the pandemic and, and you had, uh, I think you had 30 plus mm -hmm. uh, come to the state and, and work and, and also share what they can expect, particularly you have, you know, have one applicant who has, you know, mentioned that she's applied for the uh, program, but mm -hmm. what they're to expect um, from a work standpoint, from you know, living quarters, all that good stuff, so they can just mm -hmm. have a better idea of, you know, what they're going to be walking into. Uh, this, this is a great question, uh, Dr. Perkins. Last year was very, very challenging for everybody. We had selected the students. We had actually set some up with, with the, uh, the private companies. And COVID happened in March. And it was a, a shutdown in, in the state of Michigan. But I, myself and our team were very concerned that if we did not continue that program last year, it may slowly die on the vine. Because we were on an upward trajectory. We went from four to eight to to, to where we were last year, 30. Mm -hmm. And some of the universities where they stay say, well, we're, not, we're gonna shut down for the summer. We, we, we can't we can put them up. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing is putting them up in hotels. But we still, you know, where before we'll give them a car where two of them or three of them can, and carpool, we give mm -hmm. each of them a, a vehicle. So you don't have that, uh, that issue of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, it was still challenging, but what I think helped us a lot was that the industry uh, was open-minded to, well, okay, even though this, which is the first year we, we decided to do with a private uh, partner with the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we trust you. If you think this will work, we will try. And I, I think uh, uh, all things considered, it, it was a good program last year. And I'm so happy that we did not suspend the program. I think it would have been very tough to try to continue this year. We probably would have gone to a, a lesser number. Now we increased the number because we had um, a company that said, I want five of them. Like, Whoa. Right. I mean, the, the demand based on the success last year just went, I mean, skyrocketed. And we're going to try to work our way through. That's, that's, to me, the essence of leadership is to see a challenge in front of you. How do you get around it? How do you still make things work within what you, you, know, what you presented? And I, I, I think the idea to put them up in the hotels and bypass the universities, uh, it worked out. This year, some, some of the universities say, I think after... We've all learned to live with this pandemic. They, they're beginning to figure out how to continue to operate. Now we're going to do that. Okay, good, 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 good. Appreciate Thank it. You. Mm -hmm. um, we have about six more minutes. Are there any final questions at this point? Well, um, we want to thank you very, very much. Uh, appreciate all that you've shared with us. And uh, we certainly look forward to uh, having you in the future um, participate in our conference. And they are showing their appreciation for you with all the icons. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Perkins and uh, you. Dr. Rillette for, for having me. Uh, anytime, I'll be glad to come back. I, I truly, truly enjoyed doing this. For sure, for sure. Thank you, thank you so Dr. much. Okay. Dr. Right. Rillette, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you. That was uh, that was an excellent talk, uh, Paul, and and I do appreciate your insight. You know, my takeaways just for the students on the on the call was just the the perseverance, right? The, the opportunity you take it and you persevere. I think uh, what a great story, starting off in a community college, moving on to university, going through a, a career to the now you're at the top of one of the the best DOTs in the country. It's very. Very inspiring, and thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Appreciate it.